If I've learned one thing from day trading on Robinhood, it's that with some things, you don't really even need a fundamental grasp, understanding, or intelligence of to be a master at. Sadly, that doesn't really work with music theory. So today we're going to learn one thing that's really going to enhance your music theory. All right? That one thing is dominant seven chords are going to exist on the five and the three chord in any key. Okay, so off the bat, you may be like, well, what... I don't know what a one, two, three, four, five chord is in music theory. That's not music theory. That doesn't count. That's like saying learning to count to 10 is doing math or memorizing the alphabet is reading. Not the same, okay? So today we're really going to do a deep dive into dominant seven chords. All right, we're going to start off in the key of C. And the most common dominant seven chord you're going to see in the key of C is G7. A lot of different ways to play it. Now, what does that do, okay? It has a function in the key. And basically what a G7 does is it brings you home, okay? So 99.999% of the time, a G7 is gonna be followed by a C. And just like 99.9% .9 of the time, I make money on cryptocurrency. No big deal, right? But that isn't the only dominant seven chord you can have in the key. So. First of all, if we think about the key of C, there are six main chords, right? The notes are just C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Those are the seven notes. They make chords C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor. We can really get crazy with those B half diminished chords if we want to, and back to C, all right? We can extend those chords to have the chords that have the letter after them, C major seven, G dominant seven, right? But that dominant seven is gonna be the tricky one that we're gonna talk about today, okay? Because for the longest time I was like, oh, all right. Well, these dominant seven chords just kind of exist to bring any progression back home. For instance, we could have like a, a C to E minor, A minor, G seven. And that kind of makes you, that forces you to go back home to C, right? But what I said earlier was that the three chord in any key can also be a dominant seven chord, okay? So what's the three chord in C? C, D, E. E7 looks like this, all right? Now you've probably played a song that has an E7 chord and a C major chord in it, right? But the interesting thing about this, and this is where it kind of gets music theory wise, is look where my pointer finger is right here. That's on a G sharp, all right? G sharp is not in the key of C. So how are you gonna come into my house and tell me that E7 is a chord that you can play in the key of C? Well, this is the important thing, all right? So, sidestepping from dominant seven chords for a second, I have a question for you. What would you consider the second most important chord in any key, right? Or maybe even just the second most common chord. A lot of people be like, all right, well, the home chord in the key is the most important chord, that's why it's home, right? I never loved the sound of a C chord to a G chord to a C chord. To me, that always just kind of seemed almost like cliche. And I don't, I don't want to say that like it's wrong or it's basic or anything like that, but it's just not a sound that really ever appealed to me musically when I'm playing and like the songs I listen to. I always gravitated towards a lot of the minor keys, all right? And now arguably the most important minor chord in a key is going to be its relative minor, all right? So in the key of C, that's A minor. C major and A minor. In fact, if you just play, uh, let's play that same progression. Remember when we went C, A minor, E minor, G? But let's actually just go A minor, A minor, E minor, G, right? A minor, A minor, E minor, G. That totally has such a different vibe, right? And I think... A lot of songwriters, a lot of musicians kind of tend to err on the side of minor, right? So even though we're just playing those same chords in the key of C, if I really wanted to push something back here to this A minor chord, I'm staying in the key of C, right? That G major chord, even as a G dominant seven chord, doesn't give me that same resolution back there. So what what is gonna give me that resolution? Well, if you think of A, is one, right? Even though in the key of C it's six, and we count from A, A, B, C, D, E. We just said the dominant seven chords 
push a chord direct, uh, progression in a certain direction, okay? So if we take that E minor chord, which is just the E chord in the key of C, but make it a dominant seven, that's pushing us back home, which is now in the minor spot, right? So really, even though that G sharp note, which is an in the key of C, it still works because it kind of gives us the dominant version of an A minor chord. In fact, the reason that kind of got me starting this was yesterday I posted a cover of While My Guitar Gently Weeps with uh, my buddy Pasha, who just slays the violin. And uh, again, it's, it's a very A minor centric song, right? Uh, and then it pivots on this E7 to an A major. Right? And I was like, you know, that's just such a great example of just kind of why dominant seven chords aren't just meant for the five chord in an, of a tonic key and stuff like that. In fact, I did a whole lesson on that on my Patreon if you're interested, because I just go through the whole thing and just really talk more about the chords. And there's so much more stuff on there. So check that out if you are interested in like more deep dives and stuff like this. But uh, I really think that thinking of dominant seven chords on the three chord and the five chord is just a really kind of important thing to do that you'll you'll discover more as you study deeper and deeper into chord progressions, all right? And, uh, you know, if, I've, if I'm looking at older songs, and I'm talking about, like, songs from, like, you know, the 1930s and 40s, you'll see that their use of dominant seven chords is all over the place, okay? Like, they're, like, I've never seen so many dominant seven chords until I looked up, like, a ragtime piano song or something like that. And the reason being is because I think back then the music had more of, like, a, a tendency to really kind of, like, just, like, follow, like, a very, like, you know, I don't want to say strict, but they're really getting pushed in a certain way. And the rules were actually probably even looser that, like, whatever your target chord is in any key... Like, let's say I want to go to the F chord in the key of C, right? Well, I can kind of like look at this F chord and be like, all right, well, what's the what's the five away from F? All right, I go one, two, three, four, five. I can figure out that it's a C, right? So maybe I'm in the key of C, but I know I'm going to go to an F chord as part of my progression. Before I go to the F chord, why don't I just hit him real quick with a C7? Even though C7 isn't in that key because I have a B flat instead of a B, so on and so forth, that'll still work, right? I could even start with a major seven chord. Like, let's do a chord progression where it's like C major seven. Let's make it simple. To F. C major seven. C major seven, F. C major seven. Right? See, when you just hit him with that C7, to kind of use that as a dominant chord into the next chord, it works, right? Major seven to dominant seven to F. Make that a, a dominant seven. Where is that leading? Then you just start to kind of get the idea of like, okay, well, now I maybe just took some basic chords and I maybe just learned one thing that I didn't know before, that that three chord could be a minor chord, it could be a dominant seven chord. And all of a sudden, you're kind of getting into like the harmonic function and movement of all sorts of chords within a key. And then you're starting to borrow chords from other keys, but eh, doing it in a way that has intention, right? Just think of like if you're writing a chord progression or if you're trying to arrange something creatively uh, that you already know. I think it's just really valuable information to think of like, all right, well, what's an interesting way to get to that next chord? Because I remember when I was first trying to write songs, everything did kind of sound the same, right? I, I just, I really liked the sound of descending patterns, staying away from the five chord. So something I would do a lot, I would maybe do like the four chord. To the, to the three, to the two, to the one, or something like that. But then it's like, you know, I had these kind of like descending things, but they were always the same, you know? And then once I started thinking about like, okay, well, what if I just start trying to like utilize these chords in a way that makes sense instead of just plugging and playing in different chords that I've learned and know, maybe the chord progressions will sound better. And then I actually became a little bit more happier uh, with my own personal writing, okay? So let's just do uh, another example. Let's say the people's key, the key of G major, right? So the second most common dominant seven chord you'll see after that G seven chord is probably D seven, right? 
because that's the five chord in the key of G, right? G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. Those are the notes in the G major scale, right? So on five, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. That D7 is always gonna lead you back home, okay? So, doing just what we just talked about, what would be another dominant, secondary dominant could be a term that you could use for this, to find out how to get to the relative minor of the key of G. So what's that most important minor chord in the key of G, right? I'll give you a second, but I always think the easiest shortcut, no matter what key you're in, is to find your root note and go three frets back. That's always a super easy way to find the relative minor of any key. So now E minor is the relative minor in the key of G, right? So if you wanna use those chords, G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, F sharp half diminished, but make it more of a edgy, satisfying experience. Start on E minor, right? And then it's like, okay, well, that kind of takes away that D7 to G resolution for me. So again, what's the three chord in the key of G? G, A, B, there you go. Just as often as D minor, a lot of times you'll see B7, I would argue probably like the third most popular dominant seven chord because it works as like a second dominant chord, a secondary dominant in the people's key, the key of G. And that leads you home to E minor, right? So the last thing I wanna talk about this just number wise is uh, Kind of like a jazzy term that you may have heard before is a 251. I've done other videos on just a 251, but it, it just kind of relates to this, right? So a 251 in G major, remember G is one, so that's, we know we're going to end up on one. Two is A, right? So A could be the two, five is the D, and one is G major, right? So A minor to D major to G. So harmonically, you can hear those kind of have a certain push towards each other. But what if we made those all dominant seven chords, right? Because we already know that that five to one is exactly a great example of what we've been talking about this whole video. But what about a two, A7, D7, G, okay? because the two chord is actually the five of the five. We just said the five was a D, right? G, A, B, C, D, right? Well, what if we started here? If D is one, one, two, three, four, five. Well, that's the five of the five, that's A, right? So A7 can move you there, it can move you there, all right? So in that case, we used a dominant seven chord on the two chord. So, like I said, the one thing that you had to learn here was the dominant seven chord can be on the three chord or the five chord, but guess what? There are no actual rules. That was just a great example of using it on the two chord as well as the five chord, right? So all this to say is that it can be kind of confusing at first, getting into all this stuff and seeing how these you know chords and harmonic function works and all this movement. But I think really just taking bite-sized pieces of it and then keeping an eye open for maybe why chord progressions move in a certain way for songs that you like, and then dissecting that is really the best way to learn music theory, you know? Again, I was I was like a huge uh, Radiohead fan, one of my all-time favorite bands, and it wasn't until I really kind of got their chord progressions, Exit Music for a Film is a great example of uh, something like this, also on the Patreon, by the way, where it's like, okay, there's actually like a really, a really well-established method to all this. And uh, once I stopped just trying to memorize the songs I liked, once I was able to kind of dissect them and see the patterns, I just really know that it meant the world for my personal musicianship. So anyways, I hope you learned a lot. I hope you learned one thing, and that one thing snowballs into a bunch of different things. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, hit me up in the comment section, Instagram, Twitter, or the website. I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.